I mean, basically it's like, man, I poured in personal resources and cash into something that just was not, was not turning, you know, profit was not turning results at all. And then the pandemic hits and people in California, basically we had over 50 employees just stop working. There was nothing that I've done up until that point um, that had failed. This was actually the first time that I failed in business. Hey, how's it going? It's Tim Brown. This is the Hook Better Leads podcast. And today I'm with Graham Desert. Or is it Desert? Great question. Yeah, it's it's spelled dessert, but pronounced desert. Desert. But whatever. Desert. Yeah, wh- whatever. Th- hey, man, whatever you want it to be is cool with me. <laughs> We're talking about lessons from bankruptcy and the pain of leadership. Uh, heavy is the head that wears the crown sometimes. We're talking about all those things today on this podcast. Graham, can you give us a little like two minute? I know we're going to be talking about your story a lot today, but can you give us a little bit of a two minute background for those of you that are those of the people that are watching or listening that haven't heard of you or Mm -hmm. um, your story? Sure. Yep. I grew up in a large military family, 10 kids in the family. Uh, My dad was in the army. We moved every two or three years. Um, Grew up in Colorado. Um, lived in, uh, I don't know, all basically all up and down the East coast, um, moved to Kansas city. That was his last station. That's where I went to high school. That's where I met my wife, where I went to college, where I started my first business, where we started our family. Uh, eventually got into the roofing industry in 2008, uh, after working for a local roofing company as a sales rep, um, did that for about a year and, uh, you know, f- just really enjoyed entrepreneurship, man. Went off, uh, you know, on my own as a, as a roofer. Basically what I did was, it was, you know, a one man show. I would, uh, sell the job. I would order all the material and schedule everything, coordinate everything for my subs and my subs would, would take care of it. Um, so I did that for a number of years and then, uh, the vision, the vision over time steadily grew. And so, uh, at that point, uh, let's say it's probably 2016 or so we were doing four or 5 million consistently every year. And, uh, we're in a very comfortable spot. Uh, my wife and I decided to move to the San Diego, California area. Uh, so we now live in Carlsbad, California. And at that time we decided to uh, expand the company. So we brought on partners from there and uh, started to rapidly expand the company and, uh, grow the vision. Yep. And I know so that since, that's a, yeah, that's a really, no, that's really useful. And I, it sets up our story because I know that during COVID you guys had some serious setbacks and it ended up being pretty catastrophic for the company. And I know that since you said, don't let this be an excuse for those of you that don't, that don't take big shots. So you're like, I don't want to be a lesson in not taking big shots because you guys were aggressively expanding and there was this moment. And um, if you could give a little dramatize the details for the listener, just so they can experience this and that maybe they don't have to yeah. experience it, but what yeah. happened and what were those moments like where you kind of experienced like, Oh shit, something's slipping out of control here. And mm-hmm. what did, what did you go through emotionally at that time that led to your decision? Well, I think, um, Ultimately, you know, when we, when we, when I moved from Kansas city, cause that's, that's where I grew you know, spent a lot of time there, probably 24 years of my life in Kansas city. When I moved from Kansas city to San Diego, there's a big difference between Southern California and Kansas city. Yeah. You know, I came here and it was like, holy cow, there's over 20 million people that live in Southern California. California, the state is the fifth largest economy in the world, not not just in the United States, it's in the world, fifth largest economy. So Mm. there's a lot of money in the state. There's a lot of money that flows and, uh, just my eyes started to open. So my vision started to expand as I started to see, uh, the vision started to grow and the desire to grow, uh, got bigger and bigger. And, you know, and I've always had that at a, at a young age, I started my first business when I was 20. And the question I asked myself after my first season in business was like, man, if I could do this by myself, I wonder what I could do with, you know, a team of people. So 
I moved in that direction and was successful with a team of people. Then after that season, I was like, okay, if I could do this with a team of people, what could I do with like five or six teams of people? And so I was constantly um, pressing the, the, the possibility of what was, you, you know, the, the possibilities. Yeah. I was always at that, testing what the boundary was, testing what, you know, was possible. Mm -hmm. um, even, even then after that, that season, it's like, wow, so I could do this with five or six teams. You know, I was 23 years old operating a franchise with 30 some odd employees and was the number one franchise in the country at the time. I was like, man, so what's next? So you, you got in this position where you knew you could lead people and you've got solid things happening. Um, right. What really made you take the bigger shot and did you have, like, did, was there funding involved here or anything like that? How did, as you got into, roo it's Roofing 101 was the company, is that correct? Correct, correct. Roofing 101 um, was the company. We actually, we actually rebranded prior to all, prior to deciding to, um, you know, expand. Because I knew, I'm like, okay, I got to build, if I want to expand the company, we have to build a solid foundation to build on. Okay, and that solid foundation is like getting your vision tight understanding your identity as a business, understanding your identity as a leader, the core purpose, the core values, the mission statement, the taglines, all of the branding, the belief book, all of that stuff together. So I worked, I spent about six months doing that. And then at that point, it was like, okay, now, now we're ready. Mm -hmm. So uh, as far as funding is concerned, to, to answer your question directly, we took out loans, so we took out debt. Um, okay. And there's two ways, you know, when you're going to expand, like there's a couple different ways. You either pour in your own cash, you mm -hmm. use somebody else's money. And when you use somebody else's money, you either take it on as debt or you give up equity. And mm -hmm. so um, we kind of did a mixture of all that, but it was mainly debt. Um, yeah. I mean, like, so that can be a very solid way. Like, you know, a lot of people like mm -hmm. to, instead of give up 10, 20% of your company or more, just, you know, there's ways to do that. Right. So that's, it is not, yep. it's, de it's definitely an option. Um, as far as like when you when you were building this business, um, how how long were you guys up and running, and how what was like the top end revenue that you guys hit? Top end revenue was over. I think it was like close to eleven or twelve million. Mm -hmm. um, how long we were operating? Uh, let's see. Partners came in in two thousand eighteen. Uh, we started and we brought solar in in two thousand eighteen. So four years ago. Um, and let's see, 2019 was the year where basically I was the solar sales manager. I mm -hmm. came in, we, we brought in all the solar sales reps. I trained everybody out in the field. Mm -hmm. And then after about four to six months, we had leaders trained and developed. We had solar sales managers yeah. trained. So then they took over the solar business. I stepped out and this was the rapid expansion. So we had like 50 some odd solar sales reps by, was it September? September of 2019, just in California alone. And we were building a solar sales division in Kansas City as well. Mm -hmm. um, which, by the way, I think that's one of the one of the lessons I learned was some markets are ready for solar and some are mm -hmm. not. Yeah. And yeah, no, that makes a lot of that's, sense. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, basically, it's like, man, I poured in personal resources and cash into something that just was not was not turning yeah. you know, profit was not turning results at all. So, um, that was one of the things that I, that I definitely learned. Um, so, you know, and I, in, in solar, like it's a great thing. It's very good here in California. Mm -hmm. It's a great thing here in Cali. Uh, the, the utility expenses are so high per unit mm -hmm. that it just makes sense. Like it doesn't, and so it was very, very easy to sell it here. And great consistent um, and sun, it, right? Like there's just a lot of sun and like it's, I don't know exactly. Consistent sun, the sun hours, you know, yeah. I mean, I live in San Diego. So Southern California, is it, it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Some places, it's, it's like pulling teeth. Like they have to believe in it uh, to be able to sell it. In Kansas City, it was super easy to generate a lead. Super easy. I could go door knock and talk to five people and four of them were like, yeah, I would love a quote. Mm -hmm. you know, because they want educate something new and shiny. They, they want the education on it. But then when you look at numbers and when you look at savings, it's just a totally different sale. 
So that has since changed. You know, that has since changed. I'm not saying solar is a bad thing, but we um, we were not good because we were new to solar. We were not good at actually selling it. Mm-hmm. So one of the lessons is I would have brought in a solar sales consultant mm-hmm. um, that uh, that could help us with that. And you you now uh, you had you've had a good amount of experience now for Sunrun as well, correct? You were you're mm-hmm. involved with uh, some leadership there, and you were bringing in salespeople correct. and stuff like that. You probably learned a lot since all that. <laughs> I mean, can I, I know that we're going to get back to a little bit of the bankruptcy stuff and stuff mm-hmm. like that, but. What have you learned from that organization maybe that you'll carry um, into some of the stuff now that you're doing for uh, leagueofleaders.com and some of the stuff that you're doing there? Well, it's a uh, what's great about Sunrun is they're, they're the largest solar company in the country, if not the world. What was cool mm-hmm. is watching them, uh, they acquired their biggest competitor, Vivint Solar. So... Just like a year ago, like literally they just, so you see this culture clash of, of these two companies coming together. So from a leadership standpoint, um, I got to see this and there's, there's constant problems, constant conflict to resolve on, on a, mm-hmm. just a daily basis, uh, sales dealing with operations and the, the culture of Vivint, the locker room, uh, culture coming into, you know, an operations minded organization. Uh, it, it just, there is, there's a clash. Man, and so that whole, that whole like sales having to deal with operations thing is just so consistent and roofing too, right? Like just that, like, mm-hmm. where is the line in this company? I mean, it's hard, right? As a business owner to try to really separate that stuff out and salespeople are a little entitled, right? To sometimes. Yeah. So like there's, there's a lot of dynamics at play here. Um, as a person that, you know, like where, where do you stand as far as that particular question? Like how much operations or like fulfillment do you think salespeople should have, have to have? Today's episode is brought to you by Sales Transformation Group, the number one sales and transformation platform in the construction industry. If you're looking for new ways to professionalize your sales force and generate more profits for your business, find out more at salestransformationgroup.com slash hook agency. Well, I believe that salespeople should have communication with the customer from the time they generate the lead all the way to like even after the customer pays. I mean, mm. you've got to have constant communication. Um, I think that's important because you're the one that brought, you are you were the initial contact with the company. Mm-hmm. So I, I feel that's super important. Um, and you know what's tough is when you have, uh, in that particular organization, there's thousands of employees that work there. You know, they're publicly traded. Um, they've they have almost a billion dollars in, in cash, not operating. It's just like cash, cash. So Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very large financially healthy organization. Um, and when you have that many people in it, uh, customers can get lost. Like the, the customer touch, you Mm. know, uh, customer service touch can get lost. Um, and especially with like the technology, the technology yeah. piece of it, like the CRMs and things like that, being able to organize a file properly with the communication and the amount of touches a customer needs, all the steps of the workflow, that kind of stuff yeah. uh, can be very, very difficult. And it can start to, the bigger you get, the more clunkier it can get. So as you grow and scale, you actually need to simplify your processes so you can scale faster and scale better. You know, you have to I once had a... a- individual sales rep at Sunrep or Sunrun um, reach out to us about a website. And I was like, I don't know if you should have your own website as an individual sales rep, but I think some of the incentive structure or some, he was just like, yeah, if I do my own, uh, you know, self gen lead, then I mean, and I, I like he was, so he was looking into us as like a, as a marketing company for him as an individual because of the, the incentivization around self gen leads and I remember being mm-hmm. like, man, there's a lot going on over there. It's an interest. I mean, that like, obviously the numbers all look yeah. good for salespeople that are crushing mm-hmm. it at that company. I mean, it obviously is a good chunk. It could be, uh, you know, the, the top reps, um, yeah. at least here in Southern California are doing really well. 
you know, yeah. there's some that are making seven figures. Yeah, so, that's, that's uh, it's amazing. a great, it's a great, great company yeah. to work for a great organization. Um, you know, it was just, it was time for me to move on because I had, yeah. a, you know, better, better mission. All right. Let's talk about this, the, the crucial months and lead up to this situation and, and what, what you learned from it. So with the, the bankruptcy, what led to it? How could somebody avoid this situation in the future? I mean, those are the things I want to know. Well, um, there's, there's a couple things. So we, you know, obviously we had debt going into the pandemic. So that was one, um, that's one thing, uh, mm -hmm. two, um, we had, uh, some leadership walk out. So at the end of 2019, there's a, a, a culture difference, you know, some, some, some of the leadership didn't like the culture and the changes mm -hmm. that were going on, you know, like we, mm -hmm. we had plans to grow. Uh, we were getting LLCs and, and getting the legal structure set up uh, for mm -hmm. every state west of the Missouri. Mm. And, uh, you know, some of the some of the, you know, managers didn't necessarily want that. They didn't they didn't want uh, the extra responsibility. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to grow and develop. And so uh, they walked out and moved on and actually started their own business, which is totally mm -hmm. cool. Um, and so that was one thing because when you have when you have significant leadership leave in a business when you're scaling and growing it leaves gaps you know it leaves revenue gaps so we have a revenue gap uh plus uh we're growing and scaling and hiring solar sales reps and mm -hmm. roofing sales reps uh, in the places where we're operating and that requires obviously it requires payroll because i mean yes they're you know, they're commissioned sales reps, but we're also paying them, you know, minimums while they're training. So mm -hmm. we're paying minimums while training. So, and we're also, you know, training them. So it requires trainers. So we mm -hmm. at that point, we had, um, we had, you know, classroom and field trainers. We had recruiting managers to pay. Uh, we had obviously the, the sales reps and the production managers, all these people on payroll. You have revenue walk out the door. Uh, you, you have incurred debt. Um, mm -hmm. You finally, finally figured out the formula to turn profitable at the end of 2019, moving into 2020. And then the pandemic hits and people in California, basically we had over 50 employees just stop working. Mm -hmm. And so then, you know, what's, what's interesting is these, these debt payments and these bills, like you still got to pay your bills, you know, like mm -hmm. just because there's a pandemic doesn't mean you just stop paying bills. You know, they, mm -hmm. people want their money. So, um, the debt payments kept on going, uh, obviously. Um, and then obviously when the pandemic hits, there's a two to three week period where nobody really knows what's going on. Uh, mm -hmm. so we're just chilling it. We're just chilling at home. Well, when mm -hmm. it's time to get back to work, um, people didn't want to go back to work. Mm -hmm. So we had all the investment that we made hiring and training those people, uh, basically went out the window. Dang dude. Yeah. So, so it was like a, it was, it was a, a, a number of different things that compiled on top of each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wouldn't say it was like one thing. It's like yeah. probably like five or six things together. Cause that whole issue. like gear up. When you're gearing yeah. up and you're kind of like you're you're ready, I've heard mm -hmm. I've heard that there's a spot too. Like people will say, like a, a marketing agency I talked to was talking about like they added the layer of leadership. I think they were at like 50, 60 people, and they added the layer of leadership up to like seventy five to scale past to go to like one twenty, mm -hmm. and then yeah. they didn't make the leap, so they just got stuck with that like overhead, um, correct? Like management layer yeah. that just kind of like weighed on them so i could see that so, totally we were we were set up we had all the people in place all the management and the executives the structure everything in place to do 100 million we had it all in mm -hmm. place we had everybody was trained and ready and good um and just unforeseen circumstances like you can't yeah. you can't foresee a pandemic you can't foresee yeah. A culture clash and just you know some people walking out the door um yeah you know you can't and even when when it happens it's like okay cool all right uh so this is where we're at all right so what next mm -hmm. okay so we come up with plans and we're like okay uh we're gonna have a revenue center here we're gonna you know drive this and um you know this whole division will pay off debt and stuff like that and it just didn't work 
You know, mm-hmm. we came up with a plan to, to work it and it didn't work. So we had yeah. nine months to figure it out. Um, and then it just, it just didn't happen. And so at that point, at the end of January of 2021 is when I knew I was like, this just, this isn't mm-hmm. going to work. Yeah. You know, it's, it's time. So I, I have a, a question for you, Graham. Yeah. Why'd you go so hard? Why'd you go so hard? Um, I, dude, that's just, that's, that's who I am. Yeah. You know? I, I mean, I started business that way. Um, yeah. you know, I was 20 years old. I mean, I, when I started my first business and, uh, for me, it's always, uh, it's adventurous. You know, I look at, mm-hmm. um, you know, not necessarily like money or anything like that or status or anything like that. It's more so, um, just seeing what's possible and Mm -hmm. becoming, becoming the man or the person that it is required to actually accomplish those things. That's, that's what attracted me about it. Um, because I want to learn, I want to grow and develop. If somebody absolutely has to, what would you coach them around something like this? Like, um, if, basically like if somebody had to do bankruptcy, like, and I'm just like trying to figure out like, was it important for you? Like you had to do that, right? Like, so what, what else like would you say about that as far as like for people that may be in a situation that requires that or or whatever? Yeah. So, I mean, I signed all everything, um, you know, in a perfect world when you do business, it's unsecured and you can just, sign on the dotted line and you're not attached to the loan or you're not attached to the debt, but uh, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get approved for it. Are you sick of what passes for leads these days? What's wrong with shared leads or Facebook ad leads? Not much, unless you want to be the lowest bidder on every job. I'll wear a lot of hats, but search engine marketing and website i am passed off to a Google specialized team. And you know, you don't enter into a situation thinking, oh yeah, I'm gonna fail. Oh yeah, this, this isn't gonna go well. You know what I mean? Like I was mm-hmm. not thinking that. I had not, there was nothing that I had done up until that point um, that had failed. This was actually the first time that I failed in business. Mm-hmm. And so, um, there was so, yeah, I mean, I signed on the dotted line. Uh, and so I was per, I personally guaranteed these loans. And so mm-hmm. when you're at a point where there's no money coming in and these, these loans are, are due, um, I mean, you just, you communicate with them and you call them and you just talk to them mm-hmm. and be real with the situation. Hey, this is what's going on. This is where I'm at. This is what my plan is. This is what I'd like to do. And you try and, and you try and uh, come up with a plan with them. Um, and that's what I did. I mean, I actually wrote letters to the owners of, of some of these banks I actually met the CEO of one of the banks, uh, at a mm-hmm. branch and got her email address and sent her an email. And I, like I personally wrote apology letters cause I, I felt, mm-hmm. um, terrible about it. So it's, I wrote yeah. these letters, uh, not, not one of them responded. Um, you know, I mean, yeah. I, they're all busy, but, um, yeah. So, uh, to, I guess to answer the question, it's like, if I was to, uh, if, I mean, I guess what happened was, you know, we tried, it didn't work. Uh, I tried to come up with plans with, with them. Uh, these mm-hmm. people did not, the, the creditors did not want to, um, have any sort of a plan. They were just like, this mm-hmm. is what it is. Um, I had bank accounts, uh, seized, um, you know, I did, there weren't really any assets at that time because, you know, we sold, we sold property already. We had houses in Kansas city. We sold those, uh, we cashed out retirement plans to fund the business or to live on, you know, during this time. Cause you're not, I'm not getting paid. You know what I mean? So it's like, we're, we're, yeah. we're living off of these things and paying personal bills with these things. So all the assets are gone. So you, yeah. I was literally in a position where it's like, I don't have anything to give you. There is nothing yeah. here. I can't yeah. like, I have, I have $5. Would you like that? You know what? Yeah. There, yeah. there really was nothing. And so the only option mm-hmm. was to file bankruptcy. That was the only option. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. 
And, and that's just that's the spot some people will be put in. Uh, question: Any other like lessons before we go into what you're doing now and how you're helping people? Um, what other lessons would you say came out of this experience, or are you are you far enough past it? I guess where you you're starting to really metabolize some of the things mm-hmm. that you. I'm sure it, you'll you know you feel some of these in your body, like the amount yeah. of like pain that yeah. they had for you, like as a Mm. as a leader in this organization. So what did anything else? Um, well, yeah. So, so, I mean, I don't, uh, I, it can be painful for people like it, it, the process took a very, very long time. Um, Mm -hmm. normally bankruptcies take one to two months. This took seven months, uh, because of the size of it. It was, um, it, if you add everything up, it's a little over $3 million, which, Mm-hmm. It's kind of ridiculous. So that's it. That's mm-hmm. a lot. Yeah. So uh, there were a lot of people involved in it. Looking back at it, uh, another lesson would be you need you need a board of directors. You need to be a part of some sort of a peer group or mastermind or have a coach or a mentor. You know, as a business owner, you need people looking over your shoulder mm. to just. Um, see your blind spots because when you're in the trenches or when you're in it, there's things that you're not going to be able to see. And if we had, we had this peer group, had we had this mastermind or had we had a coach or a mentor or a board of directors, some of these blind spots would have been revealed. You know, the, Mm -hmm. the five, the five to six things that kind of added up. And uh, maybe they were revealed, and um, you know that's where persistence and drive can really get you in trouble. Is when you just persist, mm-hmm. persist, persist, and you're like, ah, "We'll yep. work through it. We'll work through it," which is great. That's a great quality to have. Uh, but there are times mm-hmm. where you have to like pause for a second, look at it objectively, and make mm-hmm. decisions. Is this truly what we need to do? Should we pump the mm-hmm. brakes just for the next four weeks? You know. Mm-hmm. There is what, and the other thing is timing of things too. Our growth, our growth trajectory was was set out in phases. So we had we had phases we were going through, um, and my responsibility shifted as the company grew. Like it if sh- it shifted like every quarter. You know, it was like every three months mm-hmm. I was doing a different responsibility. So I was at the tip of the spear. I'd get in, I'd build it, and then I would pass it off to somebody else. I'd get in, I'd build it, and pass it off. And so what I was doing was I was working on technology, which is great. That's a beautiful thing to work on. And it was going to be necessary, you know, in, in two to three years from now. But there were things going on that required my attention that I was, mm. I, I was not privy to because I was working yeah. on the business. So people talk about working on the business and working in. It's a beautiful thing to work on the business. But when things aren't going well in the business, you have to be able to pull off of those projects, the the beautiful things that you're passionate about to get in the weeds and get dirty again. And so mm-hmm. I didn't do that fast enough. Yeah. Yeah. People talk about it's that all the time. Processing. Yeah. People yeah. talk about that all the time. Work on the business, work on the business, which is great. That's a beautiful yeah. thing, but you have to be able to do both. Yeah. And this, yeah, the, the landscape changes. And if the landscape gets a little bit more treacherous right in front of, you know, the troops or whatever, being there and being, um, being able to kind of see what's happening, like it does require jumping back into these, these bits. All right. Talk to me about League of Leaders. What are you doing there? How are you helping people? What's the vision here? Well, it's, it's simple. We build leaders. So that's, that's what it's all about. Um, we start with working on the interior of the person, leading yourself, teaching people, training people on how to lead themselves so that they can lead other people effectively. So it's an inside out mm-hmm. approach. Uh, we focus a lot on, um, you know, the very first part of it in the first course that uh, is, is launching in a couple of weeks is called the leader's DNA. So that's all the inner workings of a leader. You know, your belief systems, your identity, your purpose, your vision, your mission, your values, how you set priorities and standards for your life, those kinds of things, because it's super important. People think that, um, you know, you can just operate without it and you can. But oftentimes what I found is if you don't have that set first, you're working on things that 
you may be working on things that actually don't align with who you are and what you're good mm. at and, and your strengths. So, yeah, so that's what check this out. Check this out at leagueofleaders.com. Um, sign up for this uh, free challenge, free three day leadership challenge. Um, check out what Graham's working on. Graham, I love what you're talking about with belief. Because I really have noticed belief has a lot to do with how the leaders of my company operate and how I'm helping them because if their beliefs are not in alignment with where they want to go, if they don't believe in the things that would allow them to get where they're going, it essentially has to be there has to be some change up in that belief. And that we have self limiting beliefs, right? There's a lot mm-hmm. of self limiting beliefs. Um, so how are you working through that now? through this process, I know you've been through some stuff. You learned probably a ton from that experience. You learned probably a ton through leading folks at Sunrun and it looked like you had a pretty cool run there. Mm-hmm. And uh, like, what, what, how are you working through belief in your own life? And we'll, we'll leave this as the final question here. Yeah, well, you have to know like what you believe in and what you stand for. Like I, I've, there's core, there's core beliefs that are deep down in our heart that we all believe, you know, like I believe in opportunity. Mm -hmm. I believe that everybody has an opportunity, no matter what the circumstance is, you know, no matter where you live, no matter what the circumstance is, I believe in opportunity. I also believe in taking action um, that's purposeful, you know, intentional. So intentionality is really, really important to me. So it, it, these are things that I identified, you know, five, six, seven years ago and, you know, it actually shapes everything. It shapes what you think about. Mm-hmm. It shapes what, you know, the things that you say. It shapes how you act. It shapes the environment that you're in. And so all of that's super important. And if you're operating a company without understanding, you know, what you believe in, um, you could be missing out on just mm. that, that extra unique thing, that extra, mm-hmm. you know, you're not operating at the, the, the highest capacity. You know, you have that battery life of 100%. You may be operating at 40% because you haven't mm-hmm. identified all of those things. So it's all the internal yeah. makings. You know, everything flows from the heart. Everything flows from what you believe in. You know, and that's a that's a principle for life. Absolutely. All right, Graham, uh, I'll let you kind of, anything you want else you want to share or anything, um, what, what do you think people should do next if they would like to connect with you? You know, hit me up on social media. I'm on all the channels. Uh, Graham Desert. It's pretty easy to find me. Um, hit me up on legalleaders.com. Check out some of the some of the stuff there. You can actually the vision with that is for people to become members and to create a group, a league of actual leaders that are that are building, uh, you know, that are going through the building blocks and actually attaining the skills to become more effective in what they're doing. Um, that's one of the one of the key things that I've learned over the last couple years in business um and we do it we do it leading fit so it's not it's not just you know your normal sit in a classroom boring type stuff it's i want people to uh have transformation in their lives take care of their bodies take care of their minds um you know get involved in fitness uh understand nutrition um learn how to build trusting relationships with the people in their lives their coworkers, their family uh their friends their spouses you know, stuff like that. So all of that is part of this program. Awesome. Sounds amazing, man. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on and being generous. I think like sharing, I really believe this and I believe it's good for organizations and in your organization too, because there's new people sometimes, right? Sharing failure is one of the most generous things you can do. It's brave. It's difficult. And it's like very useful. Because the more we share it with each other, the more we can avoid stuff like this, you know, and certain things. So really appreciate you being really generous with us. And I, um, I'm i rooting for you. And it's cool to see what you're doing with LeagueOfLeaders.com. Thank you, everyone, for watching the podcast. It's Hook Agency. It's put on by HookAgency.com and Hook Agency all over social. And um, drop a comment if you enjoyed the podcast below, if you're, if you're on YouTube. And otherwise, leave us a review. And I hope you guys have a good one. Bye. Thanks.